Uh, that's debatable because firstly theoretical international relations and real international relations sometimes have very little to do with each other. That's because I think social scientists try and uh, discern uh, patterns and almost scientific rules in human behaviour and the more I've been involved the more I'm convinced it's less about that, it's more about um, foibles of individual leaders, um, it's, uh, uh, it's cock up rather than conspiracy in my opinion, but it was a good grounding to have. Uh, in terms of languages, I'm very uh, typical of a, of a foreign office stereotype, which is I arrived with German and Swedish and I more or less never ever used them at all <laughs> in over 30 years while I've been learning several other languages instead. Um, and uh, we're trying to make that much more coherent now so that people who come in with valuable languages um, get to use them. But I basically haven't. So I started very briefly, I, I, everyone who starts here, the only job you ever have where it's literally a brown envelope and you open it and it tells you, and it's like orders in the military, tells you what to go and do, that, the only time you ever have that is your very first job when you join. Afterwards you're always involved in the process and you can express your preference. But the first one, the brown envelope job, was in, uh, as a desk officer for Thailand and Laos in Southeast Asia Department. Then I was taught Indonesian and I had three years in the embassy in Indonesia. I was private secretary to the Minister for Europe, someone you may have heard of uh, called David Davis. Uh, after that I was head of section for Zimbabwe, then I was deputy head of the Drugs and International Crime Department a growth industry uh, and then I was head of the human rights department uh, which was a, a fantastic job so that's it in brief and now I'm direct director of the Foreign Office Diplomatic Academy. Yeah the Diplomatic Academy is is obviously it's part of the Foreign Office and it's basically our internal school where we teach the basic facets of diplomacy and all the specialist knowledge that people may need according to their job. It depends where you are. Uh, there often isn't one. Um, it, it, the, in most jobs I've had, quite often something will happen off, out of left field, unexpected, that blows whatever plans you might have had out of the water. Uh, the job I've currently got is a little bit more predictable. London jobs tend to be, although uh, there are a lot of people here who, alongside their day job, are trained in crisis management. We have a big crisis management centre, so you can be sailing along and suddenly something happens. So for example, last year it was all the hurricanes in the Caribbean, including in uh, British overseas territories where we have constitutional responsibility, uh, and suddenly a crisis uh, centre had to be set up. Um, uh, anything can happen like that. So going back to your earlier question about what sort of people we're looking for, being flexible and being able to respond to crises and expecting the unexpected uh, is, is definitely um, a core skill that we're looking for. So there, obviously everyone has their job description, their objectives, uh, and that can indeed be what they're doing for a long time, but they can always expect something completely unexpected to happen. Like for example earlier this year the, the, uh, the attack on the Skripals in Salisbury um, and for 23 of our colleagues in the embassy in Moscow that meant uh, the unexpected for them was being asked to leave the country at seven days notice. So again that just shows that though that may be a fairly extreme example, part of being in the diplomatic service is knowing and expecting that almost anything could happen at the drop of a hat. Everybody's reality is their own normality, ultimately, if it goes on for long enough. So um, 
you, you can only prepare for it in general terms and, and looking at your own resilience and doing the, the lot of training we offer here in crisis management, but every crisis uh, will be different. So in, in, in Chile, for example, at half past three on a Saturday morning at a quiet time of the year, it was February, which is the su summer holidays in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, not a lot going on, a bit like August in the UK, for example. Um, I was suddenly woken up uh, by the sixth largest earthquake in recorded human history. Uh, and you have to go on with it. And in that case, that meant finding out whether how many Brits were involved, uh, what sort of bilateral cooperation we could offer in terms of aid uh, and, 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 and expertise. Um, and doing that, starting that from four o'clock on a Saturday morning. So that's a personal example. There have been many others. Um, and you never know what it's going to be, but you do know that something like that will happen um, from time to time during a career like this. It's part of resilience, which again is a core part of our, of our job because of the likelihood of that happening. Um, I think the main thing is to learn. Uh, we here try and have a culture that making mistakes is, is normal. Um, learn from them, uh, overcoming risk aversion, experimenting, and being very self-aware self about what did and didn't work. Yeah, that's one of the big challenges, uh, along with the more prosaic stuff of having to pack up everything you own and ship it off or back every three years, uh, which is a great uh, impulse to ditching all the superfluous rubbish that most of us have that we don't need in our lives and in our homes. Um, but again, in terms of recruiting for this sort of job, it's something to think about. Uh, people need to be to welcome that experience um, and um, welcome the experience of having to become an expert in a new area, a new country, a new issue, at quite short order. Again, learning languages is a key part of that so that you can insert yourself into a new society and, and understand it, not just at a linguistic level, but the language helps you understand the culture and the worldview and the thought processes. Um, which are often very difficult to, very, very different to ours. Um, and, um, you know, we offer uh, various courses uh, to help people shortcut that a bit. Um, and then in any embassy you work, it's going to be, as I said before, somewhere above two thirds of the employees will probably be local staff from that country and that culture who can, uh, who can also help. Uh, prepare you and uh, explain to you cultural differences, potential cultural misunderstandings, um, all that sort of thing. But the most important thing is to be open to that um, and then you're more likely to, to learn and adapt quickly. Still being alive at this point is, is arguably an achievement given, um, given where I've worked and um, how I've lived uh, over the years. When I got to Ghana in 2014, almost at the same time the Ebola crisis hit West Africa. It never came to Ghana, but it looked like it was going to come to Ghana. And um, the government in Ghana shut the airport to flights to the countries that were affected and through various means including direct contact and conversations with the president of the country we we had a big role in effectively having that decision overturned such that only a week later it was the base out of which the UN operated uh, into those uh, countries which I have no doubt had a very major effect in lessening the crisis um, and bringing it to an end quicker than otherwise would have happened. Um, that sort of thing I'm proud of because it's a real life 
event affecting potentially millions of people across many countries. And that's what diplomacy is for, is, is government to government contact to collaboratively deal with problems and solve them.